And lo, the stream has started. And thus has our conversation begun. From here to the world, and all worlds belong beyond. I'm a big girl, man. This my, this my food, I want. Mm. I'm a big girl, man. Yeah. I'm a big girl, man. That's right. I'm a yeah. Big girl, this my, this my food, I want. I'm a big girl. What up? I'm a big girl, man. I'm a big girl. All right. This my, this my food, I want. Yeah. I'm a big girl, man. Uh, do we want to give a long time for to wait for everyone or just go? Just go. All right. Well. Yeah. Oh, I did it again. Yep. Our co-host is back. <laughs> you don't say. Wow. Interesting. <laughs> I didn't know that they had those there. Part, part of me wants to just keep it as a bit. <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> uh, okay, here we go. Um... Uh, I'm going to count you in, Andrew, and then you'll take the con. Uh, <clears throat> in three, two. Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, hello. Mr. Justin Robert Young. Yo, what up? Gentlemen, how are you doing? Uh, you know what? I'm, 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 I'm real excited about the possibility of maybe seeing a rocket in, in the next week or so. Uh, we, we had been talking about this trip that Justin and I are going on down. We're going to be close to Brownsville. It would be neat if off, you know, uh, excuse us. We have to see a rocket go into space. I don't know if that's scheduled or not. Gosh. Yeah. I don't know when, uh, you're talking about going to see a potential starship launch. Well, well, we're we're gonna be like an hour away from where they will, where they traditionally launch from Brownsville, um, and uh, I, I would have to imagine that like, for the first time in my life, a casual over the shoulder like, oh, there's another one, you know, could happen, which I think would be pretty cool. Yeah, I, I the next Starship launch, I haven't heard any particularly schedule i know probably the next few months or something something's planned i don't know uh i mean if you, if you maybe you probably maybe know more than i do maybe they're gonna sneak one off on tuesday <laughs> you're gonna find out <laughs> yeah do you, <laughs> do you, uh i i would imagine every single launch has been publicly announced but it would be utterly would punk be nice. rock to to just like sneak one out <laughs> when nobody right, was expecting. let's let's get to the real issue uh Brian, can you just Google young Dennis Farina? Yeah, Dennis sure. Farina, young. Uh, uh, Dennis Farina, of course. Uh, I know him mostly from his role in Snatch. When or... he was older. Yeah, yeah. But I feel like I could do a Dennis Farina prequel right now, but I don't know. Um. Uh. Let's see. Young let's get. Photo. Let's get. Add I mean, it to the I mean, list. I, you might be able to do an. Oh, oh my good God! I'm Justin. I have wonderful news for you. Uh. <laughs> The <laughs> let's just go side by side <laughs> <laughs> on a young Dennis Farina. All right, uh, this is kind of peak Dennis Farina. Uh, uh, yeah, no, uh, and by the way, hell of a character actor. I mean, uh, I, I'm for it. Well, Dennis Farina, I think, was kind of the opposite of a character actor. He was a character that also acted. He just when he was in everything, he was just Dennis Farina. I, I feel you, like that's you, the way you would be you too. You look like the younger stand-in stunt double. They put a gray wig on to look like him and a mustache because yeah. you have a mu very very young face for the, for gray. the mustache. And no, so you're right. He's got a little bit more of a weathered face and he's got a wider face. I've got a little baby. Yeah. I got a little baby's chin here. Yeah, uh, like like you would be you would see you on the set. You'd be like, last year at Juilliard. Yeah. The thing they told me was. And he's like, whatever, kid. Yeah. Just remember uh, to don't take the fall too hard, because I gotta get up from it. You uh I I mean if if there's one thing to fault, I think that you have too much joy in your heart to Pull Dennis Farina is a bit hard bitten. He's a hard bitten guy. All right, but well, you want to know what? You know what? Actually, we had curiosity. We followed it down, and now we know that I I look too handsome to be a young Dennis Farina, which I'll take as a win. There you go. 
I, there I, you go. Uh, by the way, Elon said there may be a Starship launch the next three weeks. So could be Ooh. Tuesday. That would be a good surprise. Could be Tuesday. Could be Tuesday. Could be. Could. Let's ask. Let's just get in his mentions. I mean, he he responds to a lot of a lot of very interesting people these days. So you never know who Elon's <laughs> going to respond to. <laughs> So uh, this week has been a very exciting week for AI development. Yeah. Earlier in the week, uh, Google announced Gemini 1.5, which is an update to their, what they uh, originally had launched or announced of the model. So Gemini, uh, which is their state-of-the-art GP4 competitor, is now uh, no longer Bard. Bard is gone. Bard died. We talked about that. Yeah. And in replaced is Gemini. And now they've improved it. They haven't released 1.5 yet, as far as I know, into the actual consumer application. But some of the achievements they've said, it's it's faster in many ways. It's like, you know, OpenAI did GPT Turbo, which was to make it way more efficient. They've done basically Gemini 1.5, which is a you know pretty big leap, 1.5, just after you know, a month or so after they announced the other one. And they've said that they can give this up to, we talked about this before about like the, when you send an input to these models, we call it context, we ask it a question or give it a document. Google says that can handle up to 10 million tokens. So uh, explain that, uh, even if you've explained it before, uh, explain when- uh, uh, <laughs> I dare you to explain tokens, it again. Tokens are something that, uh, uh, I, I believe what the upper end of uh, ChatGPT four is in the tens of thousands. This is in the million. One hundred twenty-eight thousand. One hundred twenty-eight thousand. Okay, so so this is in the million plus. That is a big leap forward. I saw a lot of chatter about this, but but give folks the context as to what that means. So it's the amount of input you can give into the model when you want to ask it a question or have you you know tell you something. If I gave it. With 128,000 with GPT-4, in theory, I could put the entire text of my book and tell me, you know, what does this character do? You know, what what is the occupation? What happens here? What happens that? And you can ask certain kinds of questions that are going to be present in there. Um, and with 10 million, it means that you can just put a ton of documents in there and it will go through and find the answers that you want out of that, which is pretty incredible. Um, in theory, you know, if you gave it... Uh, millions of words of your writing examples it could then output writing samples like your sample by just looking at this instead of having to train the model on it and so tokens are basically the way you represent data to the model you take let's say you take a word the word the might be 14 comma 22 comma 3 or it's going to probably be some low number but anyhow you turn these things into numbers Everything becomes numbers. So when the model sees you write something, what it actually sees is a sequence of these numbers. When you give it an image, it does the same thing. It breaks the image up into a sequence of numbers. And we'll talk about that in a second. And that's what it looks for. It looks for patterns in these numbers to try to figure this out. So just tokens are roughly either words, parts of words, or bits of an image, et cetera. And so the, the, I don't know the tokenizer for Gemini, but for OpenAI, it's basically you know, uh, 1,000 tokens is about 700 words. Okay. Roundabout. So, so uh, 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 you might think of those as just, just chunks or, or hunks of, 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 of human data and so on. Uh, uh, what are the well, things bro broken down to almost a word level? Some, some tokens just have like, you know, a single organization. Well, uh, so one of the things that uh, I've really, I, I felt like I had cracked in working with uh, early versions of ChatGPT is to kind of, as uh, you and I have spoken in other contexts, uh, almost hypnotically just move a piece at a time. Like, hey, do you understand blank? Great. What about a little bit more? What about a little bit more? Mm -hmm. But 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 if all of a sudden you're able to feed giant data sets and say, hey, do me a favor, read this book, uh, uh, explain to me, is the theme this, this, or the other thing? Uh, it, it, it changes the rules a little bit. If, if, if I yeah, understand the, you correctly. The challenge is going to... No, yeah, no, no, absolutely. The challenge is going to be that the... Obviously, the, the higher the token count, the more amount of compute you use, it gets expensive. You know, when you talk about, you know, what is, when you put a million tokens worth of data in, is your, you know, are you going to pay like a hundred bucks, you know, per, you know, per query? Eventually, that will all come down. These things do get you know more efficient, but that is some people said, ah, we never need to do document retrieval again. Like, no, document retrieval is actually very efficient. 
it all comes down to minimizing the amount of compute you have to use. That is a goal for all of these systems. But it's exciting. It just means that, you know, when, you know, going from a 2000 token limit with GPT-3 and then doubling that for the GPT-3.5 and then going to, I think, 16 in the first version of GPT-4 and then 128. And then now we're looking at, you know, it, Google claims in the research paper, they were able to do effective, you know, recall over those tokens. Now, there's one being able to do recall, like saying, hey, does the word Brian appear here, which seems to be, they call it needle in the haystack, which they seem to show, yes, we can see that. It's another thing to see how well it reasons across that stuff. Like, will it, if I give it a book and I say, can you write the last chapter? And, and it's not always... Context uh, like, and uh, compute's not always the same thing. Uh, would I be correct in, if I was trying to understand it as like, um, uh, is there a spiky haired magician who teaches uh, people to score free drinks at the bar in the last chapter of this book? Uh, now, none of those words might be correct, or maybe the word Brian Brushwood is in there, but we're talking about that that thing. Is is that the distinction that, that, that we're well, that, making? Well, that would be... That would be more of a search. That would be more of a fuzzy embedding search. The challenge is if you if you give it the, the really thing, the complex part, if I give it 20 chapters, can it write a 21st chapter? Now, yeah. one of the things that happened was one of the AI companies that first said, hey, we've broken through, we're doing 100,000 you know, token context. They said, hey, watch, it can write the last chapter of Great Gatsby. Well, so can GPT-4 without you putting a context of Great Gatsby in there because Great Gatsby... The, the plot line, the, is, you know, the summary of that story is everywhere. Yeah. Right. And, and that was it. When I worked at OpenAI, when we wanted to test for capabilities like that, I would give them my unpublished books because we knew that wasn't in the training data. There was no summaries. It wasn't a publisher description. There weren't conversations about this stuff anywhere. By the way, which is when some of the people say, ah, it read my book or whatever, likely what that is, it just read a publisher summary. By the way. But anyhow, yeah. that's neither here nor there. Point is, is that, uh, that'll be the real test. You know, can I give it, can it really reason across? It's one thing to say, hey, I can search this thing, which great, maybe you built a kind of an embedding search system. Can you reason across thing? And a lot of people are very excited. That, that excitement might be justified. I don't want to, you know, douse it, but I would say that we've seen this really cool. Yes, it can search across this thing, but, you know, can I tell it 20 different point data points in there and then at the end have them sum those points up other than just summarizing them? information this does seem like a big moment of differentiation for alphabet and gemini that that they we have talked a lot about how much this is a can't miss there's no version of google that exists without ai by the end of this year they will they will fire everybody and rehire mm -hmm. a million other people before they give up on this prospect uh, uh they have the talent they have the lineage they have the money. This seemed to me to be a smart way to say, we're going to differentiate ourselves. You're right. The compute's going to be insane. We might be spending $100 for every time that somebody hits the return button. Doesn't matter. We're going to stake our claim by saying we'll be the ones that will benefit the first by having the, the, the compute prices come down. And we want to be known as the place where serious, gigantic uh, uh, well, people can, can upload these yeah, sorts they of things. Will, but they're not going to make that capability available outside of certain things. They'll let researchers yeah. do it. So they're not going to get crazy. They will, but they will, you know, they're throwing away more computing resources at to be sure. So they absolutely are. Yeah. You know, how much, how much of a loss leader are they willing to be on? That'll be the thing to see with Google is that um, I'm convinced that they look at the returns, like, you know, the, the latest estimates, external estimates from open AI is open AI, you know, it's going to have like, is already a run rate of like $2 billion per year. And that keeps going up every month. And so Google can certainly look at those numbers and just say like, okay, well, how much money do we want to throw out this to be, to stay in here? And a lot. Uh, unless anybody has any other Gemini thoughts, uh, there was, there was another big, I was, yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah. I, I I'm, I'm very so, into. So, <laughs> so it was, it was, Hey everybody, Google's like, look what we did. Check it out. Everybody. And it, it's cool. Great, like this is amazing innovation, really rad. and you know, I it absolutely, absolutely deserve you know credit for this. It's what we said that the Google researchers are top notch. The people handing the marketing and the exec level above there are just getting in the way of I think great research. But anyhow, 
uh, you know, open AI. <laughs> Those rascals. <laughs> yeah, like, oh, that's um, cool. Do you guys want to see some uh, cool moving pictures? Yeah, I, I actually don't know where where to even begin on this one because it's incredible. Like, uh, I'm just uh, all, all you have to do is search for Sora S O R A S O R A, and uh, uh, you'll find all kinds of incredible imagery that uh, begins with some words that become high quality vis visuals. It's amazing. So OpenAI had been working on, you know, we've talked about going multimodal. They've been working on image generation and also working on video generation. I had seen early versions of this as it was developing, and it was exciting to see the progress working on it and the, and the team that's working on it. Uh, Aditya Ramesh, uh, uh, Tim Brooks, others, and just, just a really great group of a lot of people working on this, a lot of really talented people working on this. And seeing from you know last year where it was going and you know opening i kind of it's very interesting is it i watched this happen with dolly where watching the early versions of dolly where the first images it made were kind of had that weird remember that the really creepy weird patterns you'd see you know in ai images which are basically the neural net you're basically looking at the neural net you'd see these clusters and rolls which also look like art made by somebody who's kind of going through some sort of schizophrenia or whatever. Well, and, yeah, um, yeah, like like you would see stuff like uh, too many fingers or uh, uh, a face that wasn't even, quite right. Yeah, even before you got to that, there was this weird swirly kind of you know thing to it. And then I watched with Dali before it got released, that just go away into all of a sudden crisp, clear images. So we're looking at, there's some of the cases, we're looking at some of the videos we're watching. Some of them are the success cases and they're showing some of the fail cases. So one of the most telling things here is they have an approach where basically they use a transformer network. They use thing called the diffusion model. What a diffusion model is, it starts with what looks like basically random noise, and it goes back and says, hey, uh, which parts of this should be the image? It says, oh, this part is, and it keeps improving, improving, improving. They basically create patches, these blocks within the images spread across the whole thing. They can make videos up to a minute long that are incredibly coherent. And we watch stuff like trucks driving, people walking around. It's fascinating. And they show a really good thing. If you go through, there's a, there was the landing page and there's the research paper. So if you go to openai.com slash SORA, and then you click on read the technical report, there is a graph that you will see, which shows Basically, what happened as they scaled up the compute, they show these these, you know, videos of the base amount of compute increased the amount of compute, literally the amount of compute they threw at it by four times and then 16 times. And they're showing the clear improvements and, and a couple things they did, which were different. Uh, one, they're not getting too technical. One, one of the basic things they did was they didn't crop the images. All the other image models try to do like square images or force into 16 nine where OpenAI was thinking, well, these original videos, when they were taken, were shot with a certain kind of composition in place. And if you shoot something on your iPhone, whether vertical or horizontally, it's going to be different. So they built a model that can output different formats, landscape, square, you know, widescreen, et cetera, uh, which was a different approach that other people have done. And they've done a lot of more special things as far as like, you know, using a lot of state-of-the-art research on how to like generate the images, et cetera. But if you scroll down, Brian, You'll uh, see sure. these, these examples of, uh, keep going there, keep going um, there. On the left, you're looking at weird, fluffy, morphine. They, they give it the, you know, the input of a woman with a red you know, blazer with a dog with a blue knit hat. And the, the first version just looks horrific. Second version looks better. It looks a lot like what kind of, certain, kind of sort of state of the art sort of models are due. And then you get to the 16 times the amount of compute and it's just incredibly, you know, high resolution. And, and the one on the left, um, it, it's, it's, it's unsettling because everything changes, but, but it, it's almost dreamlike is the way I would put it, where it's like, it's, yeah. you know, it keeps, the rules keep changing as you're looking at the uh, looped animation. Yeah. And then by the yeah. end, it's like, uh, nope, that's pretty much reality. So why is this such a quantum leap forward? Not like with with, with both the compute and, and what what else is happening here based on the research? One of, one of the ways it's sort of described is that 
the model has physics. It really understands a lot about physics there. When you look at the, the, the first example they have of the woolly mammoth walking across the tundra, and they have weight, they move, and they'll show you fail cases. Here, they're showing the advantage of when you train a model on the full resolution of the source image, you get the image on the right. If you train it or crop it, then you get what's on the left where the person's out of it. So these frames, they're really good. So that's a big part of it. Um, these are some you know, things you see interactions, but watch as this guy walks, you can see the movement of the weight in his belly, you know, moving across. You know what's neat too is you look at like the shadows. You know the, the shadows are there. It, I would it just, never, just amazing... not not in a million years would I suspect any of these of being AI. Yeah, just one year yeah, ago. Yeah, when, when it's called out to you, you you start looking for patterns and stuff. But you know when you don't know that it's going on, yeah, it's very easy to do it. But then they show you the fail case of like a plastic chair and it doesn't know how to handle that. You know, um, it's sort of like floats and just just hovers and so yeah. on. Um, but it's just that the thing there, you're looking at this person walking in the reflection of their feet in the water in there and just the model able to get all of that. It's yeah, there there is there is some fascinating uh, uh, memes going around this morning comparing the the video that went viral of a AI generated Will Smith eating French fries, which is or spaghetti yeah. that was just uh, uh, horrifying and just like, you know, nightmare inducing. That was a year ago. And now we have this being announced. And uh, uh, while it is not publicly available, it was, uh, you know, we, you had Sam Altman making Mr. Beast and various other Twitter users videos last night. So it is it is around. What we don't know is exactly how fast it is right is that is that what uh, what is still yet to it was be turning done? stuff around in like 10 minutes 15 minutes okay. so you know the, the thing that the trend of these things are is you build your model and then you do what you call there's a couple things quantization when you realize that you know a lot of those uh really long parameters these decimal point can be reduced there's sparsification where you realize that man like you know good 60 percent, 70 percent of the model is focused on you know how to make cattails yeah. And it doesn't need to know that much about it, whatever. And so you start to improve these things over time. This is a video where they basically, they can st stitch image videos together. So this is creating a seamless loop of basically a, a bike riding through, you know, uh, a forest. So the idea is that this thing will just continuously loop over and over again, which is kind of amazing. And you'll see examples of taking a video of a car driving through like a city and then saying turn it into a jungle and it turns everything around there into a jungle we looked at before we saw a historical old timey example like input video output change the setting to be uh, go back up brain oh sure yeah that's oh, the got, example got, got of change the setting to be a lush jungle yeah 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 uh so what you know what, how is this going to impact you know initially this stuff's going to be very expensive there's also going to be a lot of development in open source models. It's going to be, you know, like, like you said, like, I think Dolly, I think is, in my opinion, the smartest model, most capable, but there's so many guardrails on it. It's not as useful for other people for a lot of things. And there's a lot of models fine tuned to do really specific stuff. And I think for video, you know, it might be, you know, OpenAI and probably Google or Facebook might have the best all around powerful image, you know, video models. But there might be really good open source models for here's how to do car chases. You know, here's the car yeah. chase model. You know, here's the people in the diner mo diner talking model, and and that's going to have an impact. Like VFX, I had a friend who works in film last night text me like, man, the second unit's just going to be destroyed. Well, like, and, well and, you know, uh, I, 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 maybe not destroy. I mean, again, it depends on how you want to squint and look at it. But it's like uh, I'm firmly of the belief that. Any creative just got a promotion. They just got interns. Well, they just got a team. Well, yeah, yes, and but I think overall, like my argument is, there will be more people making better money in the creative industries ten years from now than today. But this is going to devastate VFX. Yeah. You know, instead of spending, you know, fifty thousand dollars per minute for a VFX shot, right? That those 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 are already highly competitive industries, and the ones that are going to get access start using stuff first. And I do think, yeah, for second unit, you're going to start thinking, you know, Marvel's going to be looking at this going, oh, well, 
do we need to pay, you know, $60,000 a day for a crew to go grab an insert shop and somebody open up a desk drawer or to do this or to do that? And I think it's going to go from VFX shots, I think blue screens, a lot of stuff like, yeah, VFX, like if you're not using AI, which a lot of VFX people have been hesitant to it, which we saw before, um, it's a, it was always a scary business to begin with. You know, uh, Brian, Brian, if you can scroll back up, sure. there is a, tr uh, a, a well, it looks here, no, 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 down uh, uh, just a little bit, the uh, drone footage of an old West Gold Rush town there yeah. to the left. Oh, to uh, the, the other one. Got it. All right. Uh, what Andrew mentioned, it's, it's not only the physics for me, but it's the natural sense of camera placement. A lot of the really, really mm -hmm. impressment, impressing stuff that we've seen is impressive because this mimics what we know as aerial or drone footage. And it's, it's creating a world that would not have drone footage, right? Like an old West <clears throat> gold rush town, but even some of the other shots, they have smart, uh, 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 you know, aesthetically pleasing shots in a way that the other videos are either, or the other video makers so far that we've seen in the AI space, they're all, all the images are very static or they're very abstract. The, it is just kind of a, a flat thing where well, and, a bunch and, of stuff happens, which is why like commercials, you've seen like the most effective stuff that, that AI uh, video I think has done that I've seen has been like, you know, oh, all right, here's a, a, a perfume commercial. Here's a Nike commercial. Here's something like that. Because the aesthetics of those are very abstract. They are very flat and, and presentative but they don't have personality like these like drone footage or GoPro. Like those are the things that you watch these videos and you're like, oh, it's mimicking a GoPro. It's mimicking a drone and it knows the difference and it knows how those, uh, well, and, uh, those videos look. On, on top of that, in this case, uh, I don't know if I'm right or not, but, but like production brain kicks in and I notice the, uh, the color palette temperature on there. I noticed the slight use of film grain. I noticed the bobbing up and down, which uh, it places it kind of firmly in late 1970s. Uh, so I, I'm certain that it's emulating a helicopter shot. Uh, and, and, you know, and obviously this is in Southern California based on the background. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, the best results that I've ever seen from Dolly or any kind of image generation have often involved mentioning exactly what specific equipment is being used, like a Panasonic blank blank from 1977, uh, uh, give me a Polaroid of whatever, that kind of thing. If you scroll down, you'll see some other cool examples. They talk about 3D consistency. They One, they showed like turning images to life, like just giving an image, like the same can produce images, obviously, but then they show like, they talk about like 3D consistency. So yeah, if you want to zoom on that one, um, you see this. And, and there are, and, and, you know, there are, you start to look at things, you can see scaling issues and some other stuff, but you know, the, the point is it's like we, nobody was expecting us to be where we are right now. Yeah, yeah. I guess that, yeah. So, so give us a sense of the expectations of where this tech was before yesterday afternoon. You had Google has multiple uh, text to video project. Lumiere was the latest one, and Lumiere was pretty cool. Lumiere was just really cool images, more static shots, nothing moving quite like this, but they did realistic images and stuff. You can take a look at Lumiere. I think what blew people away was just the, the, the resolution, the scope of it, the camera movements, the fact that these felt extremely cinematic, and there's a lot more going on here. And uh, you know, it, if you take it, a look at it, is, it is kind of uh, adorable that uh, the website is set up such that it's trying to run like 75 videos at once. <laughs> and so as yeah. a result, they are all freezing. <laughs> but, uh, but meanwhile, the, uh, uh, the realism is truly extraordinary. So, which... so look at interacting with the world, the first one, the painting. Yep. And if you want to go zoom oh, in on Oh, this one here. Got to, it. Got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This is somebody painting uh, a painting. Yeah. And that's what's fascinating about it is the idea that, that it's not just a repetitive motion, but we're watching as the brush hits the canvas, 
it actually paints. And that's a, that's a subtle thing, but that's a really important thing to think about because you know, the model is understanding that there's a cause and effect there. And, and OpenAI talks about the reason they want to do this is they want to be able to understand the world and you need to have a cause and effect. And so that's why there's physics, that's why there's this. It's funny because I saw a critic, you know, a, a frequent critic, you know, make a point like, ah, oh, look at like, not all these things are touching the ground or the physics is off or whatever. I'm like, you're only looking at the things that got wrong. And it's a lot of compute to do that. And I was like, you know, I was going to kind of retweet and be like, reality is cool, but it can do a bunch of probabilistic events, creating an unpredictable outcome. Glitches like inability to know about the position of velocity of a particle, information compression limit, and the enforced upper limit on speed show the severe limitations. It's like, yeah, reality has got limitations there. And you look at the amount of compute, what it's able to do, it's kind of insane. Well, this is a Minecraft simulator. So, uh, oh man, I, I think it's really fascinating that whatever this page is just wants to try to play all the videos at once. It's very vexing. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, I refreshed. Uh, okay, Old here. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll do that. Okay, there we go. Okay. So um, the big question, and keep in mind, you know, I'm trying to raise a, a, a trio of children who want to be in the arts, um, is, well, am I about to be replaced? And even Mr. Beast said some version of that. And... Uh, one of the things that I think last night we were talking about is in my experience, uh, if anything, all of this just makes humans more valuable because there it's, it's yes, it will be harder to be a mechanic who uh, makes somebody else's vision a reality. But if you have a vision, it's going to make you even more valuable uh, is what I assume, but I don't know. No thoughts on that one? <laughs> I agree. This is amazing. Yeah. This is, this is, this is I, yeah, sorry. I, yeah, I lost audio there. I wasn't refusing to answer. Um, uh, no, no uh, uh, yeah, we, we had that time of the day where the uh, internet decided to do four sit-ups, and then now, so, it's, now it's done. So, yeah, I think that, the, you know, I posted a thing and somebody, I said, hey, you know, it's going to be a golden age for artists. And somebody is like, oh, this is going to be, you know, horrible. And I'm like, I think, I said, I think there'll be more people working on the arts 10 years from now than today. And he's like, you understand why that's bad, don't you? And then I retweeted, like, a bigger demand for art and more people working at art is bad. Explain how. And he never responded. Because I think for him, I guess, you know, I think his argument was like, we don't need more competition in the arts, yeah. which again, like that's a horrible, like I, I, I don't, I love writing. I make a living from writing and yes, the world would benefit not as much, but I would benefit tremendously if I was the only writer in the world. The, the, the cult but, of the amateur. Yeah. Cult of the amateur. And, it, and it's just like, okay. I've seen the difference with people who understand art with these. I watch this with Dolly. I introduced Dolly to hundreds of artists and hundreds of people. And I can tell the outputs from a trained artist and the outputs from an amateur. I can see the difference there. And if you don't think you, if these tools are amplifiers, and if you don't think that it can give you ample, if there's nothing to amplify, then yes, you're doomed. And that's what we've said before is like, some of the people I know who are threatened the most by some of the stuff, like, yeah, they should be threatened because they're, you know, the cupboard is bare, you know, there, there, there's, you know, they're are hiding behind, you know, uh, their technicians or whatever, and not people who really think deeply about it. And I look at these tools of like, yeah, like, I mean, you know, I, 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 you know uh, 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 Brian, you're, you're showing this stuff here. And, and the thing is, is like, some of this stuff looks video quality, right? Some of this stuff looks uh, uh, like it's like, it's real, but even the stuff that looks like semi real, uh, uh, Brian, you you are the, probably the biggest video game player of us, but it looks like a AAA video game, right? Uh, or, or specifically uh, the cinematic sequences yes. from from those games, which, by the way, is a unique style of of poetry and art, where it's like you have to keep on theme for a sixty hour tale, but you need to kind of sum it up and introduce all of the characters and have everything very 
polished uh, uh, to bring you into the space, whether it's, you know, the opening for Left for Dead or the opening to Fallout uh, 1, 2, or 3, and so on. Um, uh, I, 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 uh, I'm more excited about the possibilities than fearful that I'm about to get replaced anytime soon. It's really incredible. Uh, yeah, I think that the, the, the key is to keep using these tools and to adapt to them. And, and the, you know, we've talked this before, you don't, the future is not a place where you're going to be able to sit still and that sucks. But the advantage is, you know, I spoke to uh, a group yesterday working on how to evaluate AI for mental health apps, right? Mental health applications and stuff. And you know, want to take a very cautionary approach. And one of the things I point out here is that, you know, in a developed world, you know, you can get a job and they'll pay for mental health counseling. They'll pay for, you know, fertility support, whatever. That doesn't exist in the rest of the world. You know, that doesn't happen there. And AI is one of the ways you get that. AI is one of the ways you get there. And part of it's through creating stuff like this. And part of it's going to be disruptive to things that are important to us. But the goal is for the other 7 billion people on the planet yeah. to be able to live as well as, you know, the we do, you know, and then everybody move forward. Uh, well, we hope that the rest of the world continues to prosper, mostly so they can go to patreon.com slash weird things and support us there. Head on over patreon.com slash weird things. Keep us loud, live and independent each and every week on this show. Heck yes. Also, uh, so, yeah, somebody pointed out that uh, uh, I put stuff in the RSS feed that belongs in the Patreon feed. Uh, there's a little slogan we like to have. It's called we're working on it. Uh, don't worry about it. <laughs> it's, it's like, we, this should, this show to pass. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> if you're, if you're, if you have anxiety out there, Hey, you're not alone. I get anxiety about this stuff too. At the point experiment and play with this stuff. We are in, and this is one of my, when I give my little pep talks to, you know, CEOs or people working in AI, one of them are trying, experimenting with, they're curious about it. And they say this, everything is so new right now. Everything is very new. One of the smartest people I know about generative AI for images could not tell you what a diffusion model is, could not tell you the underlying technology behind it. But man, you tell him, hey, I want this, and he figures out the prompts, he figures out the instructions, and he knows how to talk to it. He doesn't care how the black box works. He knows how to get it to do stuff, and he became an expert over the last two years, and I see a lot of that. You know, I, I talk to people like, hey, we're thinking about hiring a data scientist or stuff like that. I think I said it could be good, but there might be a 22-year-old kid coming straight out of some community college somewhere who's been doing nothing but playing with chat GPT and these other models nonstop who might know more than somebody with a PhD. It's not always the case, but it's just the, the knowledge. It's, it's like the internet. Who's an internet expert in 1993? Well, I, and it's not, uh, let's say like, Oh, what if the tool gets taken away? Will they suddenly become dumb? No, because like, uh, if you, I don't know, say, spend an hour every day talking in Spanish to uh, Chad GPT or what have you. Uh, it's not like you're going to suddenly unknow Spanish uh, or, or unlearn all the things that you've learned. Uh, so, yeah, the, the dumbest piece of advice I've heard right now is people telling their kids not learn to code. Like I see this like, ah, maybe you should learn to code. I'm like, okay, so learning to code means to understand how to talk to machines on a logical basis. And you're telling me that's not a good skill. That's not a thing that's going to benefit you, you know, in the future. Yes, languages may change. The way you code may change. But understanding how to code, how these things work, is a super useful skill. And so when I hear people go like, well, if I can write the code for you, why bother? It's like, yeah, if I can use a calculator, why learn math? That's well, just, and, and, and it's, it's, it's a bit like uh, the, the times I've heard coders the most excited about chat gpt or any uh, uh gpt model is when it's like ah oh, so great i really only speak i don't know let's say javascript and finally i can speak javascript and have it translated into i don't know python or c or whatever mm -hmm. and it's like uh, uh uh but 
you'll notice that the one thing in both cases are they understood the underlying structures. And I think that's true for storytellers. I think it's true for um, uh, people who have a, an effective uh, message they want to get out to the world. Uh, uh, the only thing is you don't need a million dollar budget to produce something like uh, the Coney 2012 campaign. You could do that in yeah. your basement now. Yeah, I think you just, you, you, Google used to have this mythical 20% time that you could spend working on whatever you want, which was really just a move to sort of hire people and people really work for city. Yeah, that's not a real thing. But I do think that everybody should have a certain amount of time they spend for a week of just exploring and trying new things and trying new tools and stuff. And it, and it can be hard to say, ah, I don't have the time. Well, one day you're going to find yourself in a situation where you're you're because you never made the time to do it you know and i'm not saying that you all have to become experts and everything but i didn't learn to code until i was like 43 44. well i didn't learn to code those my 40s and, and i was and then people told me oh why bother why bother just hire people to do it for you and i'm glad i ignored them it was the best choice i could have made and you know i don't as a product as an output i don't get paid right now for lines of code i write but i write code all the time to solve problems do things for me and it's made me productive and this isn't a call that everybody here needs to learn to code but it has been like learn to use these tools you know sit down you know play chat gpt ask why are people using it whatever and it's just you know uh, well and um uh, I, 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 unfortunately, it's the kind of thing that uh, you're uh, when you want to tell a story about how you uh, learned a thing from Chat GPT. It's a little bit like telling somebody else about a dream you had or about your drug trip or whatever. It's boring to everyone else. Like even last week, I was so excited. I'm like, guys, I learned how pumps work for wells. And then I was able to measure the size of the pond and how fast and blah, blah, blah. But but it's like that's going to become very, very normal very quickly. Yeah, but it, but it, 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 it's a, uh, it reminds me of the, the Henning Nelms, you know, showmanship for magicians is that if I pull a hamburger from my pocket, you're not impressed. But if you say I'm hungry and I pull a hamburger from my a sandwich from my pocket, it's a miracle, right? And for you, it's like you had a problem you wanted to solve and it just kept clicking and clicking and so working you through and solving it for you. And that's why I created such a reaction because it was just, you know, these, you know, we, we have these reactions all the time now. Uh, I, I legit believe that we're about to see like already humans live longer than we used to a hundred years ago, but I am convinced that the infinite patience of, uh, large language models are going to allow humans to remain engaged and not, um, you know, whether it's from hearing loss or, you know, other reasons or whatever, like I, 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 there are loved ones in my lives, uh, in my life that I have seen kind of withdraw from engaging with other people. And then you see Brian, that I've accelerate, that. Uh, you see that, you see that accelerate. And I think, I think that humans uh, just by talking to the wonderfully patient LLMs, uh, are 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 and uh, are going to engage in a persistent uh, habit of of constantly learning and growing, and I think I think that we're going to live longer on individual lifetimes as a result of it. We can talk. You know, one of the things that finally got released that was in uh, beta testing at OpenAI is memory, and so now when you use ChatGPT, you can enable memory, and what that does is. Basically, when you have conversations, you can it can remember stuff across threads. You can give it a piece of information, one conversation, start a new one, and then ask it like, hey, uh, do you remember what my favorite movie was? And it'll say, oh, yeah, it's this. And, and that's a first step. You know, it's, it's still early days, but that's going to be a first step towards an AI that over time, you know, you're able to have this continuous conversation with it, that, that every day it's not like you just woke up from a snap and it's like, hey, who are you? I'm ChatGPT. And, you know, so I'm like, oh, Brian, yeah. this again. It's not 50 first dates anymore. Yeah. Well, and uh, on top of that, one, one of my favorite demos that I like to play for other people, uh, and I hadn't really realized uh, 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 that it, only recently have I noticed that it 
pays attention to what I've said previously, but like I'll say, Hey, pretend uh, we're in a bar in Kyoto. And I think we did this on the air. Uh, and uh, uh, you know who I am, just explain who I am. And then, and, and uh, increasingly, uh, because of speaking in Japanese, I wouldn't be surprised if it's saying stuff like, okay, he's a little neurotic, a little bit self-absorbed, be kind to him, uh, be, act like you're impressed that scam school was a thing, <laughs> you know? Uh, 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 I don't know. It, it'll be interesting to see how that develops. Yeah, certainly as we start to, one, these things start to use this data in their understanding of the world and of us. And to, you know, when we get to have these dials, like now you can choose a voice, you can choose a voice, you can have, we talk about like custom inputs, where you can tell it like you have Brian, like, hey, you know, get, rate your, give me a completely made up non real number that will make me feel better for you to tell me how accurate you think something is. Um, uh, you can do things like that. And these things over time are going to get better and better and better and, and know how do we, we want to talk to it. I, I spent a lot of time swearing at chat GPT because I'm an impatient man child. Uh, oh, actually, that is maybe one of its best benefits is because turns out you talk faster when you talk the way you talk to your friends. And when uh, you have a friend like Justin who uses the F word as a comma and you get into the same <clears throat> habit, it's great. Just like... Uh, just uh, would you freaking with the thing and uh, you know the one uh, it's kind of like a chicken uh, figure that out and then it will it's really remarkable that is a great expression it's just the F word like a com <laughs> uh, wait, I stole it from Justin himself oh alright I'll get that good source of all these things <laughs> so uh, to sum up, things are moving very fast. Uh, part of the reason why Sora took off was we'd been seeing some pretty good incremental updates in the capabilities of video generation. And then this comes out and all of a sudden it felt like a big leap. Some people called it like a, you know, GPT-4 style leap in video stuff, which I, I, don't, I don't know. But I would say that the really, really telling thing there was the was that the most important example they showed was the one we talked about where they showed the difference in the amount of compute the amount of computation that you give the amount of time that it spends with compute the amount of compute that it has access to and how you saw it get better and better and better and that shows you there is a path now each time they had to go from you know they had to go you know like uh basically like 4x to 16x whatever so they had to increase that considerably and compute gets expensive. It's why NVIDIA has now become one of the most valuable companies in the world. And uh, compute's not gonna, we're not gonna solve that anytime soon. You know, we, there was the time conversations about Sam Altman trying to raise trillions of dollars to try to build computing, you know, computing facilities because, or microchip fabrication, because there's just not gonna be enough. Now that we've seen what's possible here, and the, the argument I make is, Every cognitive task that we do in work is going to find its way into being done by an AI, but that's going to then mean it needs to have some transistors there somewhere doing that computation. And the more stuff, the more we put into AI, the more efficient we become, the more the economy grows, the more things we'll be doing, and the demand for compute will never be satiated. It is just going to keep going and going. It's, it's why the sci-fi scenario, they talk about like if you know, if, if AI is real and other alien civilizations created it, then how come the whole world hasn't been turned, the universe hasn't been turned into computonium? You know, like, well, maybe it has, and we just don't know. I don't know. But anyhow, uh, compute, compute, compute. Uh, so just a side note, uh, I put on Twitter, I looked at a number of the videos that they did for Sora, and some of them have siding, sideways motion when the camera moves from left to right or right to left. And that got me very excited because... I know I do have a trick to turn that kind of footage into 3D footage. This was actually explained to me by Randy years ago, James Randy years ago, my mentor, where he talked about, he asked me a question like, hey, do you know how they got a, they made a 3D image of the moon with one camera? And I'm like, oh no. And he explained, they had a satellite orbit the moon and then taking a series of photographs and then they would take a photograph taken here would be the left eye. And then let's say, you know, a minute later would be the right eye. And that gives you two views. And so I thought about this technique a lot. And then when I saw the sideways motion of the video where the camera sweeps from left to right or right to left, I went into a timeline and a video editor took the video, 
took a copy of the video below it, shifted it, made one the left view, which just literally just you you know, like you can output a video with a your your left eye the top frame of the frame and your right the the bottom of the frame. So I outputted a video that was slightly shifted. Found a really cool tool made by some guy named Mike Swanson that let me package that and create it into a video format I could open on my Apple Vision Pro. And then I was watching the Sora videos in 3D. That's, That's insane. Uh, that may be one of the most Andrew main things I've ever heard. <laughs> like, of course <laughs> you would. Why wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was just, I, I'm, I'm trying I was to find the video it. of it that, that you, you mentioned it was on uh, Twitter, AKA X. Um, uh, but I guess they're not showing things in chronological if go, order. If you go click on one of my tweets, you can see somebody recorded a video of themselves looking at it in Apple vision pro, which isn't the same, but it does show you the kind of cool kind of ghosty effect. All right. Know? Well, I'll see if I can find it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I, it was funny because I'm looking at, I had other stuff I had to do yesterday, but Sora was exciting. And I'm like, oh, like, you know, like I love like thinking how these things can start to get to the world of 3D is cool. And I just looked at some of the videos like, oh, there's a left, right shift here. I'm like, ooh. And then I'm like, okay, I was trying to, I was trying to go to ChatGPT like, hey, how do I output this into the format for this? I was looking at Adobe Premiere, whatever. And then I just did a search and I found this guy, Mike Swanson had created a tool that just lets you take video with the left in the up frame the right in the lower frame and just use a command line tool and output in for the apple vision pro i'm like well hold well, okay and then i went into i didn't even use premiere i just used my ScreenFlow editor and just changed the aspect ratio to two stacked you know 1920 images and then it was just it was fast it was like so quick to put together because somebody else did all the hard work on figuring out how to package the video into that format that's awesome. You see the, I can look for the link too. Let me. Uh, uh, you know what? I, um, I I can find it. I just realized I'm not signed in to X. Is is the whole problem? Oh, Brian. I know. You're I know. trying to be the. Um. Yeah. Uh. You know what? I'm gonna have to do. Uh. Uh. I'll five. You could just uh. Be. Uh, I'm. Those are almost words. Here's a um, here's a anyhow. picture of Dennis Farina. Hey, <laughs> speaking of speed of which, can we, can we do picks of? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I got a pick. Uh, oh, I uh, got I got the link though. If you want to see, uh, it. yeah, okay. just email it to me. <laughs> um, send it to Mister Schwood. Uh, at uh, secretemail.com. Yeah, at um, Jamail. I didn't know you porn gave out email addresses, Brian. That's mm, fascinating. Mm, mm. And here you go. It's coming to you right now. But what was neat was just to put this out there and to share, particularly some of the people on the, the Sora team. I'm like, hey, guys, I made this into 3D. And it's like, that's a cool thing. Uh, you're like, I'm still cool, guys. <laughs> I'm relevant. Don't forget about me. Remember the time ah, there we I go. spilled my tray in the cafeteria? <laughs> Y'all clapped because you liked me? <laughs> All right, there we go. So we've got the... Uh, here, I'll turn on audio. Uh, wow. So this th this is a couple of photos that you took that were made into... Video. A it's video. It's so I took video. the video for, yeah, this 3D video. So I took that image uh, of, I don't know, is that the Amalfi Coast, whatever. They, it's moving from left to right. So I just give the left eye one view of the right, just like a few frames ahead. And so I just converted those all into just 3D videos. Uh, this That's one, like the Africa, awesome. the, the market and the guy else was cool. And then uh the train one is cool because like it did the train's not it's sort of half 3d but like somebody said i felt like i was there because the the buildings move by are in 3D. oh that's amazing they work on the quest by the way too just so you know you can try these on a quest <laughs> for you pores <laughs> for you practical people yeah practical all right that was very hey nice. uh, zuckerberg says quest is the best you know the best device because he had a really fun night the night with his friend. Yeah. I have a pick. 
it is not quite as technologically impressive as an AI tool, but I do think it's a little fun. Obviously, this week was uh, Valentine's Day. and uh, Damn! Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, and also, it happened to be my wife's birthday. We have a couple friends that have birthdays uh, this week around Valentine's Day. So maybe you got somebody that you would like to make give a little something special this week. Well, you can go to v-day.suno.ai uh, and if you've never played around we've played around with suno a lot between some of the other programs that brian and i have done but if uh, uh you just want a super simple tool that you could send to somebody that's never screwed around with it you just uh it's it's a, a web form basically where you can uh, uh uh just type in your valentine's day name or your valentine's name the person that you want to make a song for uh, what your favorite memory of theirs, uh, of, of you two together is. And then boom, it pops out three songs in three different genres. You can pick the one that you want. You can uh, ask it to do another version in that genre. But uh, uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's a pretty fun little tool where you can send somebody a song about your relationship with them. And, uh, you know, it's a good time. Uh, v-day.suno.ai. Uh, you know what? I just made a song for my Valentine, mm. Andrew Maine. Mm. Uh, oh, and Brian. <laughs> I was thinking about the time that we first met in Las Vegas, and the first thing you did was uh, uh, stole fries from me and with mouthfuls of fries said, <laughs> and I knew we were <laughs> going to be... Right. We are going to be extremely good friends. So uh, uh, here, let's take a listen to version one. Uh, oh, here we go. In a city full of lights. <laughs> in a city full of lights. Caught my eye. <laughs> in the land of dreams, you made me feel alive. It's true. <laughs> we dance like no one else was there. Just you and I. And you made me the magic in my life. It's true. Just version one of three? You oh, get yeah. the lyrics and everything? No, they do uh they do a pop song, a country song, and a rock song. Yep. I feel like Vegas is synonymous with city and lights. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, give or take. Uh, uh, but I, I look. I think I think it's a fun. It's a fun little silly tool. Send your send your friend, your lover, a little song today. Uh, I'm gonna give an old pick that is new again because we have just finished a complete lap of it. My 11 year old daughter only knows. All of Star Trek through the lens of Lower Decks. I feel like Lower Decks is the <laughs> all-time champion of picks for I, for weird things. Uh, it's yep, yeah, uh, maybe so. But but uh, but but uh, we finally got all the way through this recent season, and uh, it's it's really neat to uh, uh, to notice, like you know, we experience it through a kind of like a meta lens and. Uh, ironic storytelling and there's no irony for her it's like that's just what star trek is and i'm really pleased that it's so good it's it's quite good my my wife who is we watched some of the original star trek episodes which she liked but we never kind of got all the way through on that and she's she loves lower decks like lower decks grew on her at first she wasn't this and now she's like she's a big fan and yeah, that's that's I think her primary Star Trek has been through Lower Decks. Like, I, I Lower Decks to me is 
I, I like uh, Strange New Worlds. Have you watched that yet, Strange New Worlds yet, Brian? Uh, you know what? I started watching it when I heard there was a Lower Decks crossover where they become yes. actual humans, and I enjoyed it very yeah. much. <laughs> yeah, it's a great... I Lower Decks, and yeah, I think I, Strange New Worlds, they have like a musical episode, they do a crossover, and people like, some of the some of the Trek diehards are like, oh, it's like, I'm going to go run through a list of Star Trek episodes. You tell me you know, this is weirder than, you know, <laughs> this or that, you know, like, like, like you haven't been watching, have you? And so I, I really thoroughly enjoyed that. And I thought that, yeah, the crossover and like Lord Dex, I said, yeah, like to me, it should be canon because like, damn, it's not that crazy compared to Star Trek. And so I thought it was just really well done. The pacing is just, I, you know, ever since Rick and Morty, it's hard to watch a lot of other animation because like, I just felt like the pacing on that show is so tight. Yeah, and then Lower Decks is one of the shows that that was one of my favorite. And the crossover is With, why does everybody talk so slow? There? Yeah, yes, they're annoyed about how slow people talk in the old times. <laughs> oh, so good, so good. Uh, so yeah, uh, my pick is I'm going to do two picks at you. One, I'm going to tell people go. Have you guys seen the reviews for Dune Two? Yeah, exceptional. Oh, really? Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, no, I mean it is. Is it is, out? This is poised to be a very, very, very big deal. It's got a cast that was famous before, have only all gotten more famous, are kind of making the leap from like young Hollywood to taking over Hollywood in terms of their uh, their, their their stature and their careers. The, the the visionary filmmaker who's had hits but has not had the 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 Spielberg uh, level like uh, 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 James Cameron level big hit. That's uh, a, a Denis Villeneuve. Denis Villeneuve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and also, I guess um, uh, it was a real bummer that they pushed back the release date because of pandemic stuff. But I would imagine that only gave them more time to sand the edges on everything. Yeah, I mean the the, the reviews are like masterpiece. Like this is a science fiction epic masterpiece, which has me nervous because. That level of expectation now, um, but if it delivers on box office, it's great because Denny Villeneuve said that he wants to do Dune Messiah, so he'll probably go do some other movie than go do Messiah. If he does Dune Messiah, I mean, I'm I'm excited for there. There's there's the HBO series, you know, Dune Legacy. Like I'm very 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 excited. And contrast that with the Madam Web reviews. Yikes! Uh, Yikes! I. I screen crush, which I, Ryan Airy, I like watching his reviews, but he's a super nice guy. And you can see when he just won't want you trash a movie, even though he knows it's bad and watching him rip into Madam web was just hilarious. It was just, just I, it I broke think, him. It's yeah. Just, my, my, the, the tenor, it was amazing how many people went back to, it's a throwback film to the golden age of when <laughs> comic book movies in the aughts were just worthless. Just like like yeah. no sense of why the characters matter, a bunch of famous actors that are kind of prancing around a horrifyingly crappy script. Uh, at at the risk of uh, going long, did you guys see the uh, the Christmas card from the Fantastic Four that uh, was announcing the cast? Yeah, uh, I saw an image. Yeah. Oh, just do my other real quick before we get to that. I'll do my other pick though. Is uh, I just finished the last season of Rick and Morty. Yeah, and. That first episode, you know, when you hear like, ah, oh, Royland's left, they've got other people doing the voices, that first episode was jarring, and I just was like, oh, geez, this is not good. Second episode picked up a bit, then the rest of the season, I thought it was one of their better seasons. I really, really enjoyed I, I, it. Really I agree. I agree. I thought it was, uh, I thought it was tight. I thought, you know, look, there, there's, uh, there's always going to be a home for that show when it clicks, and I thought this yeah. season was, was they, great, they, really fun. Yeah, by yeah, by the end of it, the voices were the same to me. Like there are some early episodes. I'm like, these feel off. Yeah, you know? I think w w was the first episode the the poopy butthole episode. Yeah, 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 and that was that's hard because that poopy butthole voice is just so uh, among the most classic Roiland kind of voices that. Well, even the Rick and Morty's just yeah. sounded off, and I guess they have two two young voice actors doing them, which I think is a great approach is to have you know, a couple, you know, like mix that up, but, but, um, yeah. 
Uh, Sorry, Brian, you're the Fantastic Four. No, no, no. So, so they uh, they released a uh, Valentine's Day card to uh, uh, show off the cast, which uh, would imply that they're doing the one thing that uh, on this program and other programs I've had my fingers crossed. It is like make it a period piece, make it a period piece, set it in the 1960s at the height of the Cold War, and uh, it looks an awful lot like that's what they're doing. Well, Brian. Uh, what Ben Grimm, the thing, is reading that is a a artist rendering thing, but when you zoom in on it, it is a Life magazine cover of Lyndon Baines Johnson from 1963. Ooh. That is a real that is a real cover of uh, uh, of love of Life, or is modeled on a real cover of Life magazine. So, <laughs> and meanwhile, we, because he's the thing, they make sure to have a picture of the actual human character well uh, i think the guy that, from the bear this, this was also <laughs> to announce the cast so you kind of have to yes. have the real dude's face uh uh somewhere but yeah uh mr fantastic pedro pascal and then uh vanessa kirby who uh folks have probably i saw as uh uh the queen's sister in the crown and she was a, a more interesting character in that uh than than the queen was but you know, at least the Mister Mister Fantastic. Uh, uh, I think that they've got the the casting right. Um, you know, and Herbie the robot. Yeah, yeah. which uh, that was a bit of a surprise. Uh, uh, talk about going retro on that. Uh, 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 I'm I'm very hopeful, very very hopeful that they're going to pull this off. Yeah, yeah I mean the, the theory is that the Marvel that the Fantastic Four has been in the MCU all along. Yeah, and. And I think that, you know, as, as the MCU evolved and realized it, you know, Captain America realized, oh, yeah, Captain America was a guy. Because first, oh, we have Iron Man. He's our first superhero. Like, uh, no, and Thor, you know, uh, there, there was, you know, Nazis running around in Captain America. And you're like, you've got Captain America and stuff. You're like, oh, okay. And then the idea that, like, they could have been some explorers and stuff that just went off missing and whatever and show up just in time for whatever. I love, yeah, I love that. I love the idea of that. Well. Let's see. <laughs> That's this is what this is where. All right, everybody on three, three, two, one. <gasps> it's been weird. <laughs> okay, hold on. Yeah. Don't screw it up. Um, uh, try to find out who's the director. Got it. Of the got it. Four. Nailed it. Nailed it. Stop the recording just on time. Uh, yeah, that looks so dope. God, that'd be ah, oh, I'm so hopeful. Um, uh, you guys good for after things? Uh, yeah. Let me use the bathroom. Break. Yep. Same. Same here. Here, I'll play some rando music. Uh, you know what? Just to make it uncomplicated, I'll even make it copyright-free music. That's right. He can be responsible sometimes. Yeah, I'll be right back. There we go. Oh, oh, what do you know? Hey, yo. All right, be right back.
Main. Yo. This from so. Deadline. Uh, not only is first footage from Gladiator 2 blowing executives away, but Ridley Scott is targeting his next movie, which is a Bee Gees biopic. Oh, yeah, I heard that. I heard that, yeah. For it. I was thinking about the casting for that. Yeah. So here's my concern about the Fantastic Four movie. Yeah. One, it's Marvel. Yeah. Uh, uh, checkered, uh, checkered, 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 uh, checkered history okay. these days. Now, uh, writing Josh Friedman, who did the Sarah Connor Chronicles, yep. which we love. Yep. Um, he, he's done some other stuff that. I, I, I've seen him write great stuff. You know, like I think I, you know, I did not like Terminator Dark Fate at all, but I know that was James Cameron and, you know, a bunch of people writing the story and, you know, go, David S. Goyer, you know, whatnot. Yeah. So a lot, lot of, lot, lot of cooks funny. in that kitchen. Yeah. And I think that the stuff where I've seen Josh Friedman kind of have full creative control over that stuff. Uh, I thought has been just really good. I thought he's really, really solid writer. Um, then Matt Shankman, who loved did... WandaVision. Okay. Now Matt Shankman has one theatrical film to his credit. What is that? That was a film called, uh, like cut or whatever. What was it called? Um, and, the uh, the film was called Cut Bank, and not well reviewed. Not yeah. well reviewed. Smaller budget movie, whatever. Not well reviewed. His TV stuff, I think the stuff, the TV stuff he's been attached to, I think it's been great. But I would like to introduce you to what if we had a director who worked on shows like um, Succession? Yeah, you know. Like what that. if we had a show, a director who worked on shows like uh, Marvel Defenders, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, worked on, you know, shows like Dexter. Yeah. That sounds good. Yeah, it sounds good. Okay. I give you S.J. Clarkson, director of Madam Web. Uh, <laughs> I see what you did there. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and Hey. And I don't know. And I, by the way, Clarkson, like I'm saying, like I, I, I'm not going to write her off as a director at all because God knows what the Sony machine is like. Who knows what the they're, circumstances they're were? Uh, yeah, allegedly these are rumors, but allegedly they initially shot that movie to be set in the universe where, uh, I believe it was Andrew Garfield's Spider Man was yeah. Spider Man. Then they decided no. We want Tom Holland Spider Man, and we and they uh, were about to shoot, reshoot everything that they had shot with Andrew Garfield with Tom Holland, and then realized that the timelines don't make sense for that to be the case for what they wanted to do, and so they just scrapped all of it. And I think what what we what we have probably seen in theaters is a resulting absolute jumbled mess of a you know God knows what. <laughs> And that's why I'm hesitant to blame directors on yeah. stuff because it's, it's particularly when you work on a studio pick like that. There, I blame a director when a director goes in and then they fight for control and they get control and it's worse than what the you know. And we've seen that a couple times where I I really got more say this time with the studio. And you're like, oh, ooh, you know, like yeah. The, maybe the studio is telling you things for a good reason. Maybe you know? maybe uh, maybe maybe uh, there's a reason why the first Wonder Woman was good. <laughs> uh okay i'm not uh, naming names but yeah you know. <laughs> uh all right are you ready andrew yep in three two hello and welcome to the after things podcast i'm andrew main joined by brian brushwood hello hello justin robert young yo 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 in this episode of what we like to call the existential crisis that is brought about from AI, yeah. uh, <laughs> let's, let's do some real talk that, here. That, because... That's not even uh, an exaggeration in any way. It's like, like 
Uh, if if you ain't worried about it or you ain't thinking about it, you need to be because yeah. all of humanity needs to make some well, I think, decisions. I think, I think that, that's that's our that's our line. If you ain't thinking about it, you ought to be. <laughs> yes, you, know? you should be thinking about it. You should be. This is a good thing to think about. It should be a, 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 a positive thing to think about. It is a lot of change, but there's a lot of opportunity. With change comes opportunity. There's chaos there's a lot. is a ladder. Yeah, there's a lot. Well, that's a little too aggressive. Like that's like let's just say with change comes opportunity. That seems like there's job openings, right? Like chaos is a ladder is like I'm I'm dodging spires of of a uh, black obsidian. Uh, but yeah, think about it. We're 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 positive here in general on on the show. I. I mentioned this before, maybe I talked about this show, but I, I was, I went to visit India and I went to my father-in-law and brother-in-law's accounting firm and they wanted to know how to use AI. And at first I'm thinking, oh, I might be able to show them some cool things. You can do a spreadsheet analytics and stuff. But I said, first thing is like, show me your, show me your workflow. And they showed like, okay, we have our customer has their data in this Microsoft Excel. And then when we have to figure out what taxes they have to file, I open up an email, I copy paste this, I do this, I do this, I do that. So, you know, why not create a macro in your spreadsheets that just lets you click a button and opens up the email, puts the data in it there and do all that. I I would imagine this is the part where if I was one of those characters, I would say, how do you do that? And I would imagine you would say, you ask AI, how to do well, that? Let's, let's, there was a step in between. What's a macro? Yeah. Right, right. Okay. All right. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, yeah. You know, Excel is the most popular programming platform on the planet. And a macro is a way for you to create functions and code inside of there. And then to your point, Brian, was let's go to ChatGPT and say, hey, ChatGPT, show us how to do this. And that was, you know, that part of the conversation. So, uh, I think that in one of the things I think about is that while we're watching, you know, AI create like incredibly powerful VFX, which is going to happen soon and, and not, not, you know, it's not decades away, not end of the decade away, but maybe a few years, but it will start impacting pipelines very quickly. Yeah. But there's a lot of other areas where there are gains to be made from AI. And if you're a person who has a job involved in the field of making things, producing things, selling things, or any form of commerce or exchange with other people, there are a lot of little ways AI can make a big difference. A lot of little ways that you can use AI. And I think the more you explore it and start to look at how to do things more efficiently, the more adapted you will be. Uh, one of the topics of conversation, you know, around the campfire uh, recently was, is there, uh, when we think about what, what we have to offer the world, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm still trying to, to break this, strategy and and i haven't found a a, a crack in it yet but basically you either think and say things and that's your story you have a thing that you sell and that's your story or you do a thing your labor is your story and that's pretty much it when it comes to having something to offer the universe right um I don't know. Yes, AI is going to shake up all of the the workflows to to get your story, your thing you have, thing you say, thing you do out there, but I don't know that it breaks anything. I don't I don't the 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 idea of a story narrative, I'm not really convinced on. I don't know if it's really helpful for me in trying to understand. Uh, it's part of a bigger narrative and, and and we don't need to adjudicate it right, right just yet. But, 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 uh, like the thing you have, right. That, that goes out in the world that provides value to someone else. Um, it just feels very Yuval Harari who I just don't agree with anything he says. So I always, when I hear that sort of thing, I'm like, okay. (laughs) Okay. Well, uh, yeah, you know what? I'm going to add to my resume, uh, in the same category as Yuval Harari, <laughs> the author of Sapiens. Oh, <laughs> uh, no. Well, he, now he's, he used that because I remember, and just uh, to touch on because he's on like, ah, oh, the French Resolution, you know, nothing changed the story. I'm like, 
No, information and patterns, the way things move are dynamic systems. And, and, and when we abstract things too much to the point that it's not helpful to make predictions about or make meaningful stuff, I don't, that's where I start to go. Like, I, I, you know, I hate, you know, I hate analogy and metaphor. So, uh, Ah, you within know, sure. within my friend group, there are two wolves. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, no, one of us is addicted to the one, 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 one wolf that loves metaphors and the other wolf that says, I'm, I'm Andrew, I'm not a wolf. Please do not describe me as a wolf. <laughs> Fair, fair, fair enough. This this is a known bug in in our three way friendship. I'll, I'll, I will clarify. I will clarify. But, as, but as a person who spent you know recent job was literally as a science communicator and having to deal with these things and, and going through so much communication and studying the history of science communication and stuff. And I looked at like, when did it fall apart? And I'd go like the worst science communication I saw was trying the ones that search for beautiful metaphor after metaphor after metaphor, instead of trying to get more down to the metal, like more down to the metal. Cause like, to me, it's like, if I can give you an explanation and you can use that in a way, not to tell another narrative to somebody about it, but to literally pick up a tool and then actually do something useful with it then, then that's cool. Sometimes that path can be through metaphor. And, and I don't want to dismiss that or analogy. But I always looked at like, because when I'm like, hey, explain GPT-4 to people. I'm like, okay, I can say it's like a thing and like a thing. But end of the day, that's not going to, you know, when I'm talking to journalists and stuff, I need to get down to the metal. And I had to introduce Dali to artists. Like, how does this work? I'm like, well, let me tell you, I'm going to tell you this little thing to explain embeddings, which are going to be a little bit confusing at first. But once you get it, you'll be better at this tool. So I always <laughs> uh, run uh, the opposite like, way. Uh, we'll close the loop on this part, but I, I did think it's funny because I wanted to explain why I love metaphors. And I started thinking of metaphors to explain why I love metaphors. <laughs> I will say that if there were a 30-day outpatient <laughs> Uh, thing for for metaphor recovery i would i would send uh uh brian brushwood to it i feel like my friend could use it well so so let let's get back to the uh nuts and bolts of uh how we all agree everybody should be thinking about ai well, yeah yeah well i mean i'll tell you I, I would actually like to talk about something that we were talking about before the show uh uh brian uh you and andrew were, were talking last night we were talking before we went live that you don't know if you could describe what your business is. Yeah, I don't know. P part of it is because I am transitioning. Um, uh, I, I know for sure I'm not what I started off as. What I started off as was uh, a magician trying to be Penn and Teller, uh, and 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 I'm I'm probably not the touring college performer that I was, and I probably am not the uh, trickster telling the story about going to the bar, and I have the vague sense that I'm emerging into a new role of somebody who champions independent creators and wants to empower them. Uh, that's probably not a surprise to most people who have listened to me uh, uh, over the last 10 years. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, I, 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 I would love to hear from the outside looking in, uh, other people describe, uh, what, who I am, I guess. Well, it's interesting that you confused uh, that you, you said two different things. Cause first the initial question was, what is your business? And your business to me is something that is a lot easier to describe than who is Brian Brushwood the brand per se. And I right. think that's what you were describing just there of different ways that you were looking to influence stuff. So I would say, what is your business? Your business is broadly speaking, uh, at least in terms of the, the money, which that's how I would describe a business, right. uh, is direct to consumer sales. Uh, and on top of that, there is an ancillary revenue stream through content generation and uh, uh, that that is the primary way that you attract attention for right. your direct to consumer. Yeah, uh, uh, basically discover thing that will make people happy and have richer life knowing whether it's a magic trick or a science fact or whatever. Um, 
package it in a way that is easily approachable, uh, you know, right now, primarily YouTube and, and podcasts and so on. Uh, third, uh, say, was that fun? Uh, well, let me give you some uh, ways to spend money that might you might like. Then reinvest the money into doing research, uh, then repeat. That's 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 how I see it. Uh, yeah, but that business is very easy to describe, at least for me. So it was a surprise to me that you were that you were struggling with it. Well, uh, it's it's so vague, so as to not be uh, concrete. Like, uh, uh, for example, hypothetically, if we were to have a scenario where I was asking somebody to invest in the business, you know, sure. uh, inject $10 million into this business. If I gave that explanation, it's like, congratulations, you've described uh, business. You know, it's like, uh, what is your business? <laughs> what is your uh, uh, niche that you occupy. What is uh, 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 well, what I, are your demos? If, I if we if we said what is Disney, nobody's going to say they manufacture plush toys and hats with mouse ears, right? Them, or that they sell churros. They do those things, and those and merchandising is part of what they do. But they're an entertainment company. Disney's an entertainment company. You are a content creator. You produce content, entertainment. You know your news, whatever. You're a content creator first. There are different ways you capitalize on that through products and capitalize on the attention, whatever. But that is part of, you know, the, that is what an entertainment company is today. You know, what is Mr. Beast? Is Mr. Beast, you know, the new Willy Wonka because he makes chocolate bars? No, it's, you know, he wanted to find a consumable product that his audience of teenagers would consistently buy and chocolate bars seemed like a smart idea. And, and so I would say that like, like most content creators, you're, you yield, you use that attention to make revenue in different ways, but you're a content creator. It, it, which, which makes, uh, so if, if we're playing the game of, uh, how would I pitch an investment in my company? Uh, I, I know, <laughs> I know that, uh, uh, that is a very, uh, uh, uh wobbly, industry uh yeah, content but, creators but, <laughs> yeah it, it, it yes but you don't you don't pitch by pretending to be something you're not okay yeah and your your business grows by the more the more eyeballs or you know ear holes paying attention to it whatever the whatever your term of art is for Man, as long as there's listeners. balls and holes i'm i'm all in yeah. let's go baby so <laughs> so you say okay you have a business so how do you make business well one is you take your existing content you have and you increase the amount of revenue you make from advertising. You increase the amount of products and sales you have on that. Two, you increase the amount of content you have to get more eyeballs on your content, right? And if you're looking for an investment in this and you say, okay, what is going to be different now? What is going to be different post-investment? What is going to happen after we invest money in you, okay? And open AI, Sam goes out and says, give us money. You know, Sam can go like, because I'm cool. And some people throw money that way. You're like, because we're going to buy a ton of computers and build even more cool stuff. You, like, what are you going to do with more investment? Like, oh, you know, right now we, you know, we're going to be able to increase the amount of output on content we make. We have another show that we want to be able to do. We think it's a really good market for this. We want to have our attention on maybe acquiring other shows. We think we can streamline this. Yeah. Our product offering, I think we can lower the cost that it takes us to manufacture stuff or produce stuff. You just say, this is how we, this is either how we make what we do more efficient or how we do more of what we're doing or ideally how to do all three. And, and I would two. say without, without kind of fully opening the kimono here, both on the content creation side and on the Please product. Please do. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and on the product creation side, You've learned a lot of really valuable lessons, really valuable lessons that uh, uh, if there were an injection of cash, I think could pay off faster. I think that they are paying off now, but you would you would just be hitting the gas on it uh, uh, and, and speeding up that process, which uh, is markedly different, markedly different than the way that you've handled it in the past. I've been in twice recently in difficult positions where I had acquaintances that had businesses that were trying to look for capital infusions. And the beyond like, hey, here's a little money to help you bridge as a gift kind of thing. I really wasn't in a position to sort of help out because they were just bad businesses. You know, one was a business that 
I knew that they were going to be having because it was very focused on uh, seasonal products. Of, like they were going to have not have a good year because the industry they're in was not going to be good, and they're trying to get more money. And it's like this: all this is going to do is just bridge you another couple months, and then you're going to be facing a real hardship because you're just not going to be in a good situation. Another business is just was not a well thought out, poorly planned, and and it was you know they're coming to us like here's a business opportunity. Like there is literally you're trying to keep the lights on and there's zero opportunity for growth there. It's fine to say, Hey, you know, we, we need money to pay payroll to keep this thing going, but here is our plan for growth. They didn't have plans for growth. You know, they had plans for how we're going to ask for more money again in the future. You as a content creator, you know, you as a person, you have the infinite opportunity for growth. You know, you, you have more ideas than you have manpower and people to make happen. What does, you know, what does smartly applied capital help you do produce more content, you know, and there's also marginal utility too. It's like, you know, you know, you've, you've, you've had, you go through this period, like nobody knows what the ideal, like production companies go through this all the time. What's the ideal workforce production company? Nobody knows. There's one when you have a bunch of shows on the air, then there's one you don't, but sometimes you need people for discovery, but you could certainly think now like, okay, if you were to scale up a bit, you know, what's the most strategic use of resources and time. And that's where you think about it. Yeah. Uh, that you two, you two have, have really done a good job of, of challenging me to, to simply put these things. Um, uh, because you're right. It, 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 it uh, it ain't like, uh, 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 uh Go do a metaphor. Go it. Do it. Do it. You can't help yourself. Do a metaphor. It ain't like, like I. Uh, no, do uh, it, Brian. Do it. Do it. I'm short on stories to tell. Yep. It ain't like, uh, I don't have so much more that belongs in the world. Mm -hmm. Um. It is like. Uh, if I had more people to, uh, or more resources, then more story could get out there. Um, I, uh, unfortunately, you know, between the pandemic and between, uh, uh, the financial difficulties, very, recently, very good reasons. Uh, it, it, it just has me a little bit, uh, 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 I, I think I think both of you have done me a real favor to to remind myself like, yeah, but what if I could press the gas? Like what could happen in the next five years? Yeah, I, I, look, I think the, the hard lessons that that you are now on the other side of that you've learned, you've learned very, very important lessons about uh, uh, this process. You've learned what it's like for things to get really, really in demand, scale up a staff and then realize like what Andrew pointed out. A production company that's got seven shows on the air is different than a production company that is looking to get a show on the air. Right. And some of the biggest production companies in the world have done that. You you have to accordion in and accordion out because that's just the nature of entertainment. That's the nature of how things go. You you learned a lesson of what happens when you accordion out and the the necessity of accordioning back in because otherwise if you don't trim your sales, you're going to you're gonna have problems. You had you had those problems. You uh, uh, had that situation and saw what uh, saw what happened. You've been in this game of product creation now for nearly a decade, if not a decade. Over a decade. Over a decade. 12, 12 years now. Yeah. 12 years now. So it's like, it's not, you, you went from, let's just buy things out of a catalog and I'll put my own spin on it, I'll put my own story on it, to let's create stuff whole cloth and, and make sure that we put it out there. You learn those lessons. You recently learned a gigantic lesson about bringing in somebody fully, you know, essentially in house uh, uh, to make these things. Th this is in your pocket, uh, uh, and and look, I think you still you're you're still getting over some of the some of the bruises <laughs> from 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 learning the lessons. But uh, uh, either you're going to do something with them or you ain't. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I. I don't want to speak out of school here, but like. Brian, you've been on this journey that is the journey. That is the journey. It is the journey of every every self made business person goes through. You know, and 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 it's you can't beat yourself up for 
making a bet and trying to make things work and trying things one way and experimenting. And sometimes these things work out well, sometimes they don't and whatnot. And, you know, the sooner, you know, this, this sooner, you know, you just realize like all the things you've done, right. All the things you've learned and you see the value for that, you know, like, I, I am extremely optimistic and, and extremely bullish about where things are going. And, and it gets hard because it's like I sit there and I go like, you know, like uh, trying to define that narrative around me. Like, what am I? What am I? And some things are connected. Some things are not. Some things are not. Connect they're tangibly connected. But like, you know, uh, you don't have to fig find the overriding narrative. You just like, you know, what do you do? You make stuff. You entertain people. You educate people. Multiply. Yeah, no, I, uh, I really appreciate that you guys are challenging me on that because I think that, uh, you know, six months ago I would have been a little bit too still in emergency mode to consider, uh, that kind of thing. But, um, uh, but, but, but now I, 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 I think this is a healthy exercise for me. Brian, my man, you get up and you work, you know, that's the thing. I mean, despite all the horrible horrible things I say about you. I mean, just really <laughs> sometimes to fan theory, sometimes slanderous, libelous sort of stuff. And all the many, many flaws of yours that I criticize. The many, 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 I mean, ample, ample foibles. Oh my God. You know, that secret podcast Justin and I do where we use different names and voice changers just talk all about We can't this. tell you the name, but the initials are FBB. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I do on Brian Crush with sucks.com, just so you know. Uh, but I, you work your ass off. You are a hard worker. And that is the thing that it's just that I admire. Like, like, uh, and, and that's the thing. Like, it's that, you know, I used to think out with magic and I'd come up with ideas and I'd watch some of the people I looked up to get so petty about, like, ah, oh, you, you, I used a blue deck and you took this and did this and then you went in it too. But then I said, you know, what's more important to me, the idea or the factory? You know, man, you got a great friggin' factory that is bright. Uh, yeah, well, I, I really appreciate it. And, and I must admit, you know, sometimes we, uh, we have our own blinders on and the idea of rapidly expanding, uh, I I've it seen, it doesn't have to be or, or, or the Sorry. idea of other people investing is just, just something I had never even really considered no, before. But, and, and I think you, it, you've, uh, last night and, and today, both of you have made a very good case to consider that possibility and i think that it comes through is that is that one is you know investment does two things one you know you you an influx of capital can certainly stabilize certain things right now put you in a mental state to sort of know okay this is other somebody else believes in me somebody else believes in what i'm doing here you know like like the the reason i've been hesitant to do a startup like a startup is because a startup the life of running a ceo uh, in a tech startup is you're always fundraising you're yeah. always out there finding investment because it's purely, purely hyper growth. And I think that that's, that's the world you're in, not quite as fast paced, but that is the same world you're in where, yes, if you want to grow and do this is you, you know, you can sometimes try to figure out like, you know, how, how to manage operations at a certain level, but then, you know, how to scale. So yeah, you put together your business plan is this is how we make things more efficient. This is how we're going to scale. And this is how we efficiently scale. These are things that we know. Yeah, um, you know what? Uh, uh, I'll uh, 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 give give me a few days, and I'm gonna I'm gonna write down kind of that level of core analysis um, because, to be honest, uh, you know we all have our own blind spots, and uh, I will fully admit that it had never occurred to me. Every time anybody's ever offered me investment money, I've been all I've I've always thought ha, that's how you get screwed, but but. But at this point, you know, 30 years in with the track record I have, it's a little bit harder to laugh at. And uh, it, it is something I should consider. We, Justin and I, early on when we started iTrix, we had somebody who came and said, hey, I want to put, happy to put some money into it. And we didn't ask for a lot. I mean, it was like, probably totals like 30 or 40,000 or yeah. whatever. Like, and, and, you know, he probably would have been happy to write more checks. 
and we respected it. We respected that. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to be a grifter that took off. So every, every month when we calculated what we paid him, we, I did the most convoluted way to sort of handle the investment, whatever we paid him percentage of royalties and stuff and wrote checks and stuff like this. Then, you know, the magic business, you know, I, I started doing the TV and the books and the, the, that business just didn't do as well. And then I went to him and I said, Hey, this, you know, there's really not a lot of future here. Can I write you a check for everything you invest in plus interest? And he said, no, I, it was just fun. And it was just this, I'm like, no, I got the money. I, I'm happy to do this. He's like, no, 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 that was fine. I did it for fun. But the thing that he respected was that we respected the investment. You know, we yeah. did respect it. We, we paid, you know, we paid royalties. We paid this. We kept them updated on this stuff. Sometimes I might have forgotten to send them like, you know, annual report. But I always said when there's money, just try to take care of that. So, you know, uh, the point was, is I respect, I think, Brian, you come from a place where you respect it. But be realistic, too, is, is you know. I, we didn't have to go sell this person. I'm like, oh, we'll have amazing returns or this, this. This is a very realistic. This is a thing. It's experimental. We think we can go do this. We do this there. And I think that we sometimes get very hung up on it. But, you know, I've had other people who you know, I've put money into, you know, I've have, uh, you know, where it's almost like I give it to them, then they get other money. And then they're like, F you. I've got other money now. And it's like, I was the first person to bet on it. I literally had somebody just had that exchange with somebody. I'm like, you're there because I gave you the money to start when nobody else could give you the money to start. And and now you're treating me like, well, look at all this other money. I'm like, yes, because investor one put you there. Why so, do you think you're at the party? Yeah, I, 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 you know, so you're not going to have that problem. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, uh, you guys have, have really nudged me to consider possibilities that I don't think I would have thought uh, before, um, mainly because that's just a, a different world than, uh, I've ever experienced before. You know, it's, yeah, uh, it, if, if everything. Out there, things, Brian. Yeah. Yeah. I, my, my, my piece of advice is kind of two part. One is always be upfront, keep your investors informed, but don't feel like you have to panic on, on a daily basis or weekly basis. You know, um, I, we have a mutual friend who went through a situation and felt like within 24 hours, he had to tell everybody about this and sort of threw out a solution when it's like, dude, you could have sat on this for a week. You know, you could have sat on this longer to sort of realize this because your, your investor communications is being forthright and honest, but also, you know, being coherent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there was a line in uh, world's greatest con season three that is indelibly put in my mind. Uh, where we were setting up, I think it was one of the clips from the Yuri Geller stuff, but uh, the, the narrator goes, well, if that is true, then we all have a lot of new thinking to do. So there we go. <laughs> we all might have a lot of new thinking to do. I, 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 yeah, I, I think he says, when they, well, if that's true, then we all have a lot to think about. Uh, all right, sure. Tell the guy who listened to it 50 million times. It's fine. <laughs> we'll find out. We'll find out. Uh, are, are, are we doing any picks or 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 or, or is this uh, uh, the episode where everybody cheers for Brian to go for it? <laughs> go for it. What would be a metaphor for somebody who goes for it? Uh, I, I don't use metaphors anymore. <laughs> It's like I had a bag filled with magical ways that bridged the connection between stuff and I reached inside and found out that somebody had stolen from me. <laughs> okay. All right. I think it's time to wrap this one up. <laughs> Bye. I, I, I'm going to say it. It's been after. <laughs> All right, bye guys. We're dropping the stream. Bye. Bye. <laughs>